Hello, my friends. Wonderful to be able to worship together like this today, isn't it? I just want to welcome you to the encouraging word right here in Jerusalem. It's amazing as I find myself seated here with the Mount of Olives behind me on the southern steps of the Temple Mount, so critical to everything that we believe in and that we love so much about the coming of the Lord Jesus and the things that we study together in the Word of God. And so I'm glad to invite you today to join with me as we try to understand some of the very deep truths of God's Word. And I hope that maybe you have your Bible with you because I'm going to be in Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. You see, what we're going to talk about today is one of the most critical subjects of all time. We're living in very interesting times, aren't we? With the election in the United States, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, floods, famine, all the things that go on the melting pot of people. You know, even here in Jerusalem, one thinks about all the different people here. I love coming to this place. I love it because I think gathered here in Jerusalem are precious people from every culture, every language, every tribe, every tongue that one could possibly imagine. And when one considers all the conflicts and all the issues that go on, the separation, the unkindness, the inhumanity of man toward man, it's wonderful to think about the fact that the Lord Jesus is coming back again, isn't it? I hope that you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. And that's why we're going to be looking at what I call the real sign. The real sign? Yep. People talk all the time about the real sign. When is Jesus coming back again? How do we know? Is the time right? What's going on in our world today? What's happening in Europe? What's happening with the constellation of all the different countries and things and opinions and all the preachers saying all the things that we preachers all say? I'm going to show you something that's very critical when it comes to this issue of last times, end times, eschatology. So take a look at the Bible with me for just a moment. I want to read to you from Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. Here's what the Bible says. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which God gave to him in order to show his servants what must soon take place. I wonder how soon that is. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything that he saw. Remember, John was on the island of Patmos when God gave him this vision. That is the word of God and the testimony concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it. And blessed are those who take to heart the things that are written in it. Because the time of Jesus coming is near. Right over my shoulder here is exactly where Jesus is going to come. Mount of Olives. The Bible tells us he's going to land right there on the Mount of Olives. But I'm not going to talk about his actual coming. I want to speak to you about the greatest sign. In fact, the sign of his coming. This may come as a surprise to you. But I want you to note something that in the book of Revelation, this incredible book that deals with end times, this book that is chronological, it's the book about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the very first thing that God gives to us is what we know to be the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now it's ironic to me and rather somewhat interesting that I'm actually speaking to you from the southern steps of the temple. Another subject for another day. Because it's right here at Pentecost where the church was launched. Remember the Spirit of God came down, gave to these people utterance, 
and enabled each one of them to speak in the languages of people from all around the known world as the gospel was launched out into our world. This is where the church began. And God's word gives us a word about the church. Now here's the question. There are seven churches here. Why would God give us this word about the church and then when we get into chapter 4, all of a sudden Jesus comes in the clouds. Why would he tell us about the church just prior to his coming in the clouds to receive us unto himself? Why would he do that? Here's the reason why. I believe because the church, the condition of the church, is the fundamental zone upon which you and I need to fix our attention and our thought concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus. The condition of the church is the sign of the coming of Jesus. It's the ultimate sign. Now, there are many signs, but the ultimate sign, the final sign, is the church. Now, just by the way, who exactly is the church? Who are we? Well, I'm the church. I want to tell you why. Because just like you, I've given my heart and life to the Lord Jesus. When I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, here's what happened. First of all, I repented of my sin because I'm a sinner. I confessed my sin to Jesus and then I trusted Him receiving Him as my Savior and Lord. When I did, the Holy Spirit came to live in me. Here's what Jesus said about me. He said, you, Don, are the temple of the living God. I am the place where God dwells because Christ is in me. And so are you because you've given your life to Christ. So the church begins in the heart of every single person, whether they be Palestinian, whether they be Jewish, whether they be Arab, Catholic, Presbyterian, Baptist, it doesn't matter. This is about knowing Christ. This is about being a Christian person, giving your life to Christ. So when I give my heart to Jesus, I become the church. Then I embrace you. We embrace one another. We become the gathered church. Remember what Jesus said at Caesarea Philippi? He said, listen, he said, I want you to know that you are the rock upon which I build my church, he said to Peter. He said, I want you to know that the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The New Testament church so critical, but there's something very wrong with the church today. And this is what the letters to the seven churches are all about. So there are three things that I want to just share with you very briefly today as we begin to look at the subject of this final sign, this ultimate sign that God gives to us concerning His coming. Now, friends, listen carefully. You and I have got to study these things and we've got to understand what it is that the Lord Jesus is teaching us in His Word. And God, by His Spirit, is going to tell you something concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So just for a moment, I'm going to ask you to forget about politics, your favorite candidate. I'm going to ask you to forget about the wars, the rumors of wars, the issues with ISIS, the conflicts among nations. I want you to just think about the New Testament church. So, first of all, what was God's purpose in giving to us this revelation concerning the church? It's really threefold. Number one, to uncover. That word there, uncover, actually really is the word revelation. It is to pull back the covers, so to speak. It's almost like we've got blinders on 
And God, in His Word, by His Spirit, is giving us the letters to the seven churches to pull back the cover. So when I open my Bible here, sitting in a place like this, teaching you actually right here in the heart of Jerusalem, where Jesus, according to Revelation 21, is going to set up His headquarters for heaven forever and forever and forever and forever. You can look forward to me talking to you about that. God wants to pull back the cover. Number two, He wants to make known the things that we don't know. He wants to unveil the truth of God's Word. By the way, this is the full and complete revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the making known of all that we need to know according to God's kindness and His graciousness concerning the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who is God's Son. Isn't that fantastic? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How can any of us ever know what we need to know about God? God is so awesome and powerful and almighty. He's everywhere. He's in everything. He made everything. How can we ever know? And God here is telling us that through Jesus Christ, He is going to make known to us by pulling back the covers and letting us gain somewhat of a glimpse into what it is that He's trying to tell us concerning being prepared for His coming. And the third thing is not only to uncover and to make known, but to establish something. He wants to establish the timing of His coming. Now, this word to establish there doesn't mean the speed with which he's going to come, but rather the nearness of his coming. We use a big word there, the imminence of the return of Christ. Now, friends, let's make one thing very clear. None of us knows when Jesus is coming back. Not me, not you, not the Pope, not my dear friend, Dr. Billy Graham. None of us know when Jesus is coming. Only God the Father knows that. But what he is doing is that he is going to establish the imminence of his return because we are told repeatedly in Scripture that we need to be constantly ready. Are you ready for him to come? I mean, like this, he could come right now. He could come right now on the clouds. And the Bible is going to tell us one of the chief reasons how we can know that. So first of all, God's purpose. Secondly, God's desire. What is God's desire? God's desire is threefold. Number one, to bless those who read this word. Now, I've just read the word of God. Isn't that amazing? Do you know, I cannot tell you the numbers of times that I've just read God's word and God has blessed me. Just like that. God just blesses me. One of my good friends here in Israel, his name is Daniel. In fact, he's here with me right now. And I just went to his home just a little while ago. And he's got a beautiful home uh, that at times they can look all the way down to the Dead Sea and I just became instant friends with him. And right there in the motor car with us as we were driving through the streets of Jerusalem, he whipped out his Bible, which is all worn out and got notes all over it. And he and I were laughing and sharing together. And, and you know, I just began to think about how incredible it is that we've got a copy of the Word of God. I mean, I'm just talking about this Bible here. Look at it. I've got it. It's got pages. Now, you, I know you. Are you looking at me now? You might have... One of those gadgets, right? I mean, it might be an iPad, it might be an iPhone, it might be a Blackberry or a Raspberry or a Blueberry or whatever else you want to call it. And uh, I love them. I've got them too. But you've got a copy of God's Word. And the Bible says that what He wants to do, Jesus said, is I want to bless those who read the Word of God. I've just read it. And this is what... I read to you, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Isn't that great? He not only wants to bless those who read it, but he wants to bless those who hear it. That's what he says. Are you listening? Are you listening to what God is going to tell us about the church, about the condition of the church, about your church, my church, we the church, the gathered church, the scattered church, all across the all across the world today, what do we look like as the church of the living God? Oh, 
We're going to discover in just a little while that he's got a lot to say to us. He's got a lot of commendation, but he's got a lot of condemnation too. And I tell you, I've already concluded that if what he says in this, these pages concerning the church is true, we better sit up and take note. Because I think Jesus could well be very soon to coming back again. So what does he tell us? What is his purpose here? What is he saying? He's saying, I'm going to bless those who read this. I'm going to bless those who hear this. But he says in the third place in this passage, I'm going to bless those who act because of this, because of what they read and because of what they hear. Listen to what he says here. I love this part. He says, and I'm going to bless those who take to heart what is written in it. Do you know what it means to take to heart something? I think, I, th I think we all do, don't you? Listen, have you ever spoken to someone and you feel like it goes in one ear and then out the other? Some of you are saying, uh-huh, it's just like my son, my daughter. You know, when you look at your son or your daughter and you say, hey, I want to tell you something, this is this and that, and they, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm going to bless you not only because you read this, I'm going to bless you not only because you are hearing this prophecy, but I'm going to bless you because you're willing to take to heart and act upon it. You're going to do something about it. You and I need to be men and women of action. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm pastor of a wonderful congregation of people. I'm a very loved pastor. People thank me sometimes for loving them. Let me tell you, it doesn't compare to the love that I get back from people like you. And so many of you write to me through the Encouraging Word broadcast ministry and, and you send emails and, and you're so gracious and you're so loving. I tell you what this is all about. It's about acting upon the things that we read and we hear concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and His church. And what God is doing here concerning end times, He is situating us. He's setting us on a, on a platform. He's watching us. He's making certain that we don't just pay lip service to these things that he's trying to teach us here. All right, let's get to the third thing here that I want to speak to you about. What God is trying to say here is that he is going to act upon these things. He's trying to show us something that we don't know about ourselves. He's trying to get into our very hearts. And so what he gives us in the third place is a plan. The plan. And the plan begins right here in verse 4. Here it is. I'm going to read to you just the first verse. This is what he says in verse 4. He says, To the seven churches in the province of Asia, Asia grace and peace to you from him who is who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. And he begins, first of all, to speak. What we're about to read in the letters to the seven churches is simply God speaking to us. Isn't that an amazing thing? Now, you know, I'm, I'm a preacher and I'm a pastor and we worship the Lord together so often, week by week, through the encouraging word broadcast. What a great privilege. You know, my wife often uh, gets a giggle out of me because she'll look at me and she'll say things like, you know, it seems like, you know, you can be doing a hundred things and then when it comes time for you to speak the word of God, I call it preach. When it comes time for you to share God's word, something happens. That's what I'm doing with you right now. I'm speaking to you. I don't want to say to you what Don wants to say to you. I'm sharing with you what God is saying. And so God's plan concerning this final sign, talking to us about the church, first of all involved Him speaking to us. So just listen. We're so distracted, aren't we? Just listen to Him speak. You know, when he speaks, 
something incredible happens. The second thing that he does is he illustrates. He illustrates. Here we've got seven churches in Asia Minor, and each church is an illustration of me. Each church is an illustration of you. And each church is an illustration of every church that calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he not only speaks in his plan, but he illustrates his plan with actual churches that encompass what you and I exactly are today. When I study these letters to the seven churches, I see you and me. This, my friend, is us. And the bottom line of what he's doing in his plan is not only to speak and to illustrate, but here it is. The bottom line of what he's doing is to point. He's pointing us to himself because Christ is the head of the church. So here's the bottom line, okay? This is what I want you to think about today as we try to get a hold of this great subject. What is the final sign? How do we know when Jesus is about to come? In just a little while, I'm going to show you that as we move through the subject together. We're going to have a close look at this. And the bottom line is that what Jesus is doing is he's pointing to himself. He's asking us to look at him. How do we measure up to all that He has asked of us. What does our life look like? And evidently, the church of the living God has much for which to be commended. There's a lot that's going on in the church that He absolutely loves and He commends. But beloved friend today, does He condemn us? You better believe it. Because God reveals to us that the way in which we live, the way in which we're conducting ourselves, and what we look like as the church of the living God, I don't think is very pleasing to Him. And that is the ultimate sign of His coming. So let's do business with God together. This is His encouraging word with an encouraging word just for you now it's time for us to look at ourselves in the light of who jesus is and then to look up in full anticipation that he's coming again soon